Good morning. Please join in singing the gathering song. Chalice Unitarian Universalist Congregation. We are a community of diverse beliefs and experiences, nurturing the liberal religious spirit and united by our desire to grow in love and in service. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever your life's journey, we are, you are welcome here. Whether you gather with us every Sunday, once or twice a year, or are here with us the very first time today, we're glad you're here. I am June Bailey, the worship associate today. Our service is being led by our Re minister, Reverend Sharon Wiley. Our worship musician this morning is Tim McKnight, and our song leader is Sarah Shepard. Our tech team is Sarah Komnick and Hope Campbell, and our greeters this morning are Debbie and John Ressler. Welcome to our Sunday worship service. Welcome to those of you here in the chapel and those of you watching live on Zoom. For those of us here in the chapel, please feel free to wear masks, step outside as needed for your comfort. Also know that you'll be able to hear what is happening inside while you're outside on the courtyard. We are always delighted to see newcomers joining us in worship. As a newcomer, you might be interested in the groups and activities which can be found in our email newsletter and calendar. Online newcomers will receive an email invitation to join our email list after the service. In-person newcomers, if you haven't already given us your email address when you signed in, please consider sharing it with us as be before you leave. Our e weekly email is the best way to get information about the many groups and activities we offer here at Chalice. Now, let's take a breath together. Good morning. According to the Library of Congress, the first permanent Euro-American settlements began a pattern of displacement and land appropriation of indigenous people that continued until the 20th century. In this region that we consider home, the Kumeyaay first lived here for over 10,000 years and were the people who greeted the Spanish when they first sailed into the San Diego Harbor in 1542. With this awareness, we acknowledge that Chalice is located on the stolen, tribal, ancestral homeland of the Apai, 
which is part of the Kumeyaay Nation and the Payamkawicham Nation. This acknowledgement reminds us that we live in a history-driven present and that we need to be intentional with this land and with the people indigenous to the land. Mary Lyons from the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe states, when we, the indigenous people, talk about land, land is part of who we are. It is a mixture of our blood, our past, our current, and our future. According to the research done with Reclaiming Native Truth, 40% of Americans do not believe that indigenous people still exist in the U.S. Chalice hopes that with our first step of land acknowledgement, we can move towards educating ourselves and others about indigenous communities and their rich and diverse culture and create a meaningful relationship with them as well. Now we light our chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. I'd like to invite Stella. Is she here? Yes. So uh, I'd like to invite Stella to light our chalice this morning. Our chalice lighting words come from Lee Kenvey. This chalice is for the living, the changing, the becoming. This chalice is for losing the script of your life, the chapters about who you are in other people's stories. This chalice is for the lost GPS that was supposed to show you how to get where they expected you to go. This chalice is for skipping the directions, coloring outside the lines, painting not by number, but by silence, by wild abandon. With a brush you made yourself from light deep inside you, startling, vivid, a new voice that already knows you. Finally, a true story.
at worship and at coffee hour be an experience that tends to what is tired and hurting in us. May we be gentle with each other. May we be curious about each other. May we be open and supportive of each other. May it be so. Let us worship together. Our hymn of the month for April is hymn number 203 in the gray hymnal, All Creatures of the Earth and Sky. We're singing this hymn every Sunday this month to help us get to know the hymn and feel more comfortable singing it. Please rise, embody your spirit to join in singing. Beloved members and friends of Chalice, as we gather in the spirit of fellowship and community for this special celebration Sunday, we're filled with gratitude for the, un, for the boundless generosity and unwavering support that you've shown throughout our annual pledge drive. Today marks a significant milestone as we draw this inspiring journey to the close. 
please join us on the courtyard after the service for food and music and a bounce house and our, our congregational photo. Throughout this pledge drive, we witness how we let our love flow through values of love, justice, and compassion. As we reflect on the impact of your generosity, reminded of the profound difference that each and every one of you makes in the life of our beloved community. The latest totals for our pledge drive are we've received 77 pledges out of a goal of 110, and we've raised a total of $291,919 pledged out of a goal of 350,000. If you have yet to pledge, please do so now. We have some yellow slips of paper for you to write down your pledge today. And please raise your hand and a form will be brought to you. After this morning, we're still accepting pledges and your pledge will help so much with our planning for next year's budget. And now we invite everyone who's already pledged to come down to the front and we'll sing Let Your Love Flow with special words written by John Schultz. Come on down, everyone that's pledged so far. <laughs> Like a mountain stream and let your love grow With the smallest of dreams and let your love show And you'll know what I mean, it's the season To let your love fly Like a bird on the wind and let your love bind you To all living things and let your love shine And you'll know what I mean, it's the reason Our Sunday worship is the shared spiritual practice of our community, and we tend to the congregation during this time by sharing and honoring our joys and sorrows. Here in the chapel, you are welcome to write your joy or sorrow onto a candle card, which will be collected from you. Online, please write your joy or sorrow in the chat box with your name, and those joys and sorrows will be spoken out loud. And then we will remove this part of the service from the recording that goes onto our YouTube channel. So this sharing won't be publicly available online. If you would like to send Reverend Sharon a confidential note or about your joy or sorrow, or to make a prayer request, please email her. Her email address will be on screen in a moment. Please enjoy some music while you write down what you would like to share so that in the sharing, your burden is lessened and your joy is multiplied.
light a final pillar candle for all the joys and sorrows in our community that may go unshared and unspoken this morning. These two are held in the love and support of our community. Now I'd like to invite the children and anyone else. Our story is called God in Between, written by Sandy Eisenberg Sasso and illustrated by Sally Sweetland. Once upon a time, there was a town at the foot of a hill with no roads and almost no windows. Without roads, the people of the town had nowhere to go, and they wondered what was on the other side of the hill. Whenever they tried to leave their homes, they would sneeze through tall, tangled weeds, tumble into deep holes, and trip over rocks as large as watermelons. So they made their way to the center of the town to decide what to do. One townsperson spoke up. I have heard there is a God, and when people find God, God solves their problems. Let us find this God, someone shouted, and God will build windows and roads for us. Others thought it was a ridiculous notion. People just pretend there is a God. If God were real, God would find us. Yet the people could not see any other way to fix their town, so they decided to look for God. But there was one problem. Without roads, the people could not go anywhere, least of all go searching for God. They looked toward the edge of town where two old houses stood, each with a single window. They called the man and the woman who lived in these houses the ones who could see out windows. If they can see out windows, reasoned the people, Perhaps they can see a way to God. So the people of the town sent the ones who could see out windows to search for God. The ones who could see out windows thought that God must be on the other side of the hill, somewhere they had not yet been. They wove their way through the tangled weeds, around the deep holes, and beyond the large rocks to find God. When they disappeared beyond the hill, some people thought they would never return. The woman who could see out windows went to a tall mountain. She gazed up at the sky and tried to tug on one of the clouds. She looked down to the ground and watched the earth spin in a dizzy dance, but she did not see God. Then the woman who could see out windows thought that God might be in the deep waters that covered so much of the earth. So she set sail on a ship that went far out into the ocean. One day the sea waters turned from placid blue to an angry foam. A storm stirred up the depths and the ship tossed and turned on the waves. The woman could no longer seek God in the ocean. She could only search on dry land. Meanwhile, the man who could see out windows traveled to the desert. He looked for God in the desert winds and looked for God in the sands. The sun burned his skin and the hot ground made blisters on his feet, but he did not find God. Then the man thought he might find God in the cool quiet of a cave. At first, the cave's wet walls soothed his sunburned skin but then the black shade turned to thick ink, and he imagined scary sounds. The man became very lonely in the cave, and he did not see God. The ones who could see out windows were tired and decided to stop looking for God. Each hoped the other had been successful on the journey. But when they met, the woman saw the man's drooping shoulders, and the man saw the woman's sad eyes. They knew that neither had found God. In soft, small voices, they talked long into the evening. They told each other their stories. When dawn lightened the sky, the man said, It's time to go home. 
and the woman agreed. One of the townspeople saw the ones who could see out windows approaching the town. He called to the others and they all came sneezing through the tall weeds, tumbling into deep holes and tripping over large rocks to greet the man and woman. Tell us, they shouted, where is God? The ones who could see out windows told the gathered people they had not found God. The people exclaimed, we were right all along. There is no God. Days passed and everything was the same in this windowless, roadless town, except for one thing. The ones who could see out windows helped each other put windows in every room of their homes. Then the man and woman cut the weeds, fill, filled the holes and cleared the rocks to build a road between their houses. The townspeople were stunned. We have never been able to have any roads in this town and we have never seen so many windows. How did you do that? With God's help, answered the ones who could see out windows. But you told us you found no God in your searches. We journeyed hundreds of miles looking for God, and then we found each other, said the woman. And we discovered God was with us, added the man. With you? Right here, puzzled the townspeople. At home? Wherever we are, answered the woman who could see out windows. But I can't see God anywhere, insisted one of the men of the town. I just see you. If God is here, show us where. The ones who could see out windows spoke in a whisper. The townspeople gathered close to listen. The setting sun blushed the sky a deep red and a breathless silence embraced the town. God is in the in-between said the ones who could see out windows in the between, in between us. Who would like to come forward? As the children leave for their classes, we join in singing. Walk on your path with a song so sweet Let everywhere you go there is love all around Walk on your path with a song so sweet Let everywhere you go there is love all around The Summer Day by Mary Oliver Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is, I do not know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Stories with religious themes have been popular across time, and maybe even more so in recent decades, as religion has become less popular and more likely to be criticized. I thought it would be interesting and hopefully fun to lift up to you some shows and movies that I think are worth your attention and to reflect on some of the messages of those stories. The word theology strictly defined means the study of God, theos, 
But as I have mentioned before, I think theology is better understood as this, a system of beliefs. For example, if you believe that God is all powerful, then you must have some reasoning for why God allows so many painful and terrible things to happen. We will get to God in a minute, <laughs> but I just wanted to name that it's part of my hope and intention to get us thinking more about the theological ideas we hear and see in some of our favorite stories, especially stories that are interested in theological questions. So today I'm talking about The Good Place, a TV show that came out in 2016 and ran for four seasons, a total of 53 episodes, concluding in January 2020. Of all the stories we've heard about in this sermon series, this is the most mainstream. It stars, stars popular and well-known actors Ted Danson and Kristen Bell. The show came out on NBC has been, and has been available on Netflix for several years now. I expect most of you are familiar with it, even if you didn't watch it. So let's watch a trailer for that first season. You, Eleanor Shellstrop, are dead. Cool. How did I die? Are you sure you want to hear? He was struck by a truck advertising an erectile dysfunction pill called Engorgulate. Funnily enough, the first EMT to arrive was an ex-boyfriend of yours. Okay, that's, I get it, thank you. You're okay, Eleanor. You're in the good place. You are here because you got innocent people off death row. You are my soulmate. Cool, bring it in, man! You'll stand by my side no matter what, right? Of course I will. I wasn't a lawyer. There's been a big mistake. I'm not supposed to be here. Wait, what? Are you sure this isn't you? They got my name right, but nothing else. Somebody royally forked up. Why can't I say fork? If you're trying to curse, you can't hear. That's bullshit. Tell me one good thing that you did on Earth. Do you have a second to talk about the environment? Do you have a second to eat my fart? can't risk going to the bad place. Okay, well, maybe it's not all that bad. We'll ask Janet. Hey, Janet. Hi there. How can I help you? What is the bad place like? I can only play you a brief audio clip of what is happening there right now. <laughs> well, it doesn't sound awesome. Hello. Can I just say, I love your house. It's just so teensy. Ooh, just a big, beautiful cartoon giraffe. Oh. Cheers. <laughs> Condescending bench. Okay. So good. So good. 30 glasses of wine and no hangover. This place rules. These people might be good, but are they really that much better than me? Did you fill your bra with shrimp? No. Yes. So who's right? Every religion guessed about 5%, except for Doug Forsett. One night he got high on mushrooms and got like 92% correct. So I wasn't interested in walking, watching the show when it first came out. Uh, I thought the premise was too silly. Uh, I don't believe in an afterlife of eternal punishment or reward, but if I did, the idea that you would accidentally go to the wrong place just seemed, it just seemed ridiculous to me. So I wasn't interested in it. And then after the first season, I was hearing from friends and family that it was really good and I should watch it. And I learned what the big twist of season one uh, is, which made me want to then go back and watch it. So, you know, the series is called Sermons with Spoilers. So here it is. That's not actually the good place. She's in the bad place and she's being tortured. So the idea that she's mistakenly in the good place is how she's being tortured. And she comes to realize that. So that resolved my sense of the silliness of being in the wrong place. Um, and then, you know, the, un, you know, the next three seasons are sort of a continued rumination in different ways of what does it take to get to the, the good place. Uh, so in, in this world of this TV show, uh, conventional religious language isn't used. So, you know, we think of, we connect these ideas with heaven and hell, but that's not the language that's used. Uh, 
uh, the good place, the bad place. We don't hear about God or angels. And uh, as you saw in the trailer, she asks it early on, like, did any of the world religions, like, what is this? And he answers like, oh, you know, they all got a little bit of it right. But, uh, you know, it's just this one guy who had a vision while on shrooms, uh, who really under who had a glimpse of how the system really works. Um, so yeah, we don't hear, and I think the reason is that using this different language helps us, you know, sort of let go of whatever our conventional ideas might be of the afterlife. This clearly isn't, you know, the Christian, there's no mention of Jesus or salvation or, you know, yeah, this doesn't align with any of the world religions. So we don't hear anything about God. There's not a character called God. There's a character called the judge and uh, played by Maya Rudolph, and the judge adjudicates matters that come before her. Uh, and most of what we see, the matters would be about the afterlife. Are you going to the good place or the bad place? And she's not very busy. She doesn't you know, have a lot of stuff to do. We see actually, she tells us she spends a lot of her time binge watching television. Um, so we don't see, uh, the, we're never told that she creates that she created earth and humanity we are told she has the power to destroy earth and humanity and that you know she's been uh, in existence since the dawn of time that only hydrogen existed when she was born so her name is jen um and we learn through her that uh interfering with what's happening on earth is fairly prohibited it's not something that's generally allowed she does give specific permission at one moment in time to let someone, a supernatural being, go down for a very specific task of intervening at a certain moment in some people's lives. And then they're supposed to step back and then, you know, let it, let events unfold. So this isn't a vision of earthly life where there's, you know, things are predetermined, where there's a lot of divine intervention or miracles happening. Uh, the show isn't that interested in theology or a show about the afterlife. It's really interested in philosophy. And uh, we hear a lot about specific philosophers and their ideas as our, our sort of our group of friends we come to care about are learning about how to make choices, um, you know, moral and ethical issues. But I want to lift up for you that there's a name for, or there, there is a type of theology that aligns with what we see in the show. It's called deism, D-E-I-S-M. And deism is, is the idea that God created the world, uh, sort of set up the natural laws that would govern how things happen down here, and then stepped away to let things unfold as they would. Um, the analogy that's used for this vision of God is God the watchmaker. So God creates the watch, you know, and then winds it up and then lets it go. Uh, we're shown in the world of this world that the judge isn't all knowing, but she has access to all knowledge. She can pull up files if she wants to know what uh, someone's life has been like. And she's not watching what happens on earth and doesn't know uh, unless she looks into it. So this isn't an all knowing God who's watching over everything and again she's never called a creator this you know but this is sort of the closest we get to that sort of image in this story uh so yeah the show is really interested in this question of how do you get how do, how do you get to heaven uh the only sort of conventional language we hear is about demons so um you know, Michael, the Ted Danson character who uh, we find come to find out is a demon and there's a whole bunch of demons, but they're not fallen angels. There's no like Satan figure or, you know, head evil. It's, it's not a battle between good and evil. Demons have a job to do, which is to punish people for all eternity. And they're just doing their job. It's pictured like a big bureaucracy, uh, not unlike the the show that good omens which we talked about earlier in this series lots of desks and paperwork and you know people clocking in every day to do their work um so th th those are the f the folks we hear the most uh about so yeah there's the, the whole system of you know reward or punishment hinges on how we have performed in our lifetime and there's a points system for evaluating this and so we're going to watch a clip to explain that this is like orientation and on day one in the good place 
uh, and the Ted Danson character Michael is going to tell us how the point system work. There's an Easter egg for those of us at Chalice. We just elected otter as our favorite animal and there is a, an otter reference to look for uh, in this clip. <laughs> so let's watch. Uh, uh, hello everyone and welcome to your first day in the afterlife. You were all, simply put, good people. But how do we know that you were good? How are we sure? During your time on Earth, every one of your actions had a positive or a negative value, depending on how much good or bad that action put into the universe. Every sandwich you ate, every time you bought a magazine, every single thing you did, had an effect that rippled out over time and ultimately created some amount of good or bad. You know how some people pull into the breakdown lane when there's traffic and they think to themselves, ah, who cares? No one's watching. We were watching. Surprise. <laughs> anyway, when your time on Earth has ended, we calculate the total value of your life using our perfectly accurate measuring system. Only the people with the very highest scores, the true cream of the crop, get to come here, to the good place. What happens to everyone else, you ask? Don't worry about it. The point is, you are here because you lived one of the very best lives that could be lived. And you won't be alone. Your true soulmate is here too. That's right, soulmates are real. One of the other people in your neighborhood is your actual soulmate and you will spend eternity together so welcome to eternal happiness welcome to the good place sponsored by otters holding hands while they sleep you know the way you feel when you see a picture of two otters holding hands that's how you're going to feel every day So there are lots of ideas in the show that we could talk about. I had a few I wanted to lift up today that just had particular resonance for me. And the first is that life is incredibly precious and to be lived well. So one of my you know, areas of discomfort in the show is we come to learn that some of the things people have done to deserve eternal punishment is like being too indecisive uh, during their lifetimes, being too self-absorbed, caring too much what people think of them. These seem like pretty small infractions for eternal damnation. But I think the ultimate goal of the show is to really lift up, like, don't waste your time here. Don't waste an hour of your life trying to decide what muffin to eat or what hat to wear. Um, so they really, they really stick by that. And I think it is to, um, you know, really yeah, lift up the, the wonderful gift that life is when you think of, if you think of this time we have on this earth and then eternity, uh, this time becomes very precious and meaningful. So, you know, I think that's a, an important idea to take away. Another thing that really touched me in the show, I've talked about it in another sermon, is the idea that life is really hard. So we come to find out over time that actually no one has been getting into the good place for centuries because it's so difficult to live on earth in a way that doesn't cause inadvertent harm. Uh, everything's so messy and so hard and it takes the, the judge has to come down and see for herself how it is because she can't believe um, that, yeah, how hard it is. And uh, to me, that just really named something that feels real and hard about being alive these days. You know, you, you wanna, you know, you wanna buy your groceries without feeling like you've harmed the environment and, you know, workers who helped get that food to the store. And, you know, I think that it, it's important for us as Unitarian Universalists to feel like we're living a life of good choices and minimizing harm. And it's just really hard to feel that way. So, um, and that becomes, you know, one of the key messages of the show is that, is it fair, right? This is a philosophical question. Is it fair, is it just to punish people for, you know, sort of if doing the best they can isn't, isn't actually that easy to, it's not easy to do in the first place and it's not easy to live without doing harm. So, yeah, I felt that like sort of that tenderness and that relief of hearing something depicted that way. 
And then we do reach a point in this story where you know the group of friends we've been following get to go to the real good place, and you know after 50 episodes of them you know sort of fighting for this, it, to me it felt very emotional. Like they finally get to go, and they get there, and the good place is sort of everything many of us might picture. Like you can have anything you want. Uh, anything you can imagine, real or it didn't have to be real. You can go to any place in any time. And what has happened uh, over centuries of living that way is that the people who are there have become bored, and their brains have become really mushy. Like it's hard for them to hold regular conversations because it's just sort of the decadence of it is literally mind numbing. And uh, and so then our little team of heroes get to work finding a way for that to to resolve that to make it better. And what they conclude, the solution they arrive at, is that even after you're in your eternity in the good place, you still have one last choice to make, and you can choose to leave the good place. And it's unclear what happens after that. It's called walking through the doorway, but we would have an idea of it like sort of dissolving back into the universe. So you get to decide if and when you're really done, and you know that comes out of philosophical. Uh, teachings about that our our joy and pleasure are heightened because of our own mortality and our awareness of the things that uh, are hard and that we can lose. So that we need one in order to have the other. And the ability to have a final choice helps that group of people who are in the good place uh, find real pleasure again after that. And then people can decide if they're ready to let go or not. Uh, I think so. One reason this idea really connects for me is because I can remember being a very young child and thinking that heaven sounded really boring. Um, like my understanding of, and you know, maybe there are some rich theological ideas of what uh, uh, an afterlife of reward looks like. But yeah, to me, I just thought like, yeah, it sounded dull. Uh, you know, and I think. We are already experiencing in our lifetimes what what it's like to have some unlimited pleasures. So when we think of these stories or music, like you know, it used to be if you enjoyed a TV show, like that was it, or you know, you might be able to get it on on you know tape to watch for yourself later. But now anything we're interested in is available to us whenever we want it, and there's some loss of pleasure. In that, I must say, you know, I don't think to myself, "Do I want to watch this show?" I think, "Do I want to watch it now?" I have the whole rest of my life to watch this show or read this book or all of these things. And there's still, even though like I can listen to Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody whenever I want, there's like a pleasure that comes from coming across it on the radio, because then it feels like a gift, right? Rather than something I sought. For myself, I still sometimes flip through the channels to see what's on, even though I could watch all, any of it whenever I want. Um, so you know, there's some loss of pleasure in just being able to have whatever you want whenever you want it. So that feels very modern to me. There's many more things we could talk about. I think another, so. I'll say a couple of things briefly. The idea uh, that friendship is very important. This group of friends. Uh, not just what they mean to each other, but they can't get into the good place without each other's help. And um, so I think that's uh, you know a story about the importance of community and working together, and the the gifts that we get from knowing and being with other people uh, is really important. Something else had just crossed my mind while I was sitting on the floor. What was it? Oh, that learning, learning, and self improvement are are the keys of getting. Getting to the good place of living a good life, uh, but then ultimately being able to, you know, learn from your experiences and come to be better people. Uh, you know, it's not just a given that everybody's, you know, whatever your theology is in the world of this show, you have to earn your way to the good place, and that comes through becoming a better person. So uh, I think we're living in a A lovely time of also lifting up self acceptance and letting ourselves feel our feelings, and you know I think our work is to hold that in balance with wanting to be better people and to live good lives. So I'm sure many of you who've seen the show have other uh, pieces that caught your attention or were important to you. I look forward to hearing about that. If you didn't watch the show, know that it's out there on Netflix. Uh, if you want to watch it and join in that conversation. 
May we be grateful for reminders in all the ways that they come, that life is precious and to be savored. May we know ourselves blessed to be in community together, learning and growing. And may we um, be blessed by all the gifts of storytelling available to us in this time. May it be so. You're invited to rise in body or spirit to join in singing. Please rise in body or spirit to sing together hymn number 21 for the beauty of the earth found in the gray hymnal. Please be seated. The Sunday offering is an expression of the generosity that makes our congregational life possible. As Buddhist teacher Pema Chodron writes, generosity is an activity that loosens us up by offering whatever we can, a dollar, a flower, a word of encouragement, we are training in letting go. We encourage you to text your donation to Chalice if you haven't texted a donation before, once you text the amount, you'll get a reply with a link to enter your payment information. If your Sunday donation is meant to be a part of your pledge payment, please be sure to indicate pledge after the dollar amount. The phone number for text donations will be on screen in a moment. If you prefer, prefer to make an in-person donation of cash or check, there are envelopes and a donation box to the left of the chapel double doors, and you can leave those after, donations after the service. Please give generously.
Please join in dedicating our offering with words of affirmation. At Chalice UU Congregation, our mission is to connect through worship, music, learning, and caring ministries. This is a song by Peter Mayer, who's wrote our favorite song, Blue Boat Home. Uh, this is called Holy Now. When I was a boy each week, on Sunday we would go to church, pay attention to the priest, he would read the Holy Word. Consecrate the holy bread And everyone would kneel and bow Today the only difference is Everything is holy now Everything, everything Everything is holy now When I was in Sunday school We would learn about the time Moses split the sea in two Jesus made the water wine And I remember feeling sad Miracles don't happen still But now I can't keep track Cause everything's a miracle Everything, everything Everything's a miracle Wine from water is not so small But an even better magic trick Is that anything is here at all So the challenging thing becomes Not to look for miracles But finding where there isn't one When holy water was rare at best It barely wet my fingertips But now I have to hold my breath Like I'm swimming in the sea of it It used to be a world half there Heaven's second rate hand me down But now I walk it with a reverend air Cause everything is holy now Everything, everything Everything is holy now Read a questioning child's face Say it's not a testament That'd be very hard to say See another new morning come Say it's not a sacrament Tell you that it can't be done This morning outside I stood Saw a little red winged bird Shining like a burning bush Singing like a, Christ, a scripture verse It made me want to bow my head I remember when church let out how things have changed since then Cause everything is holy now yeah. Used to be a world half there Heaven's second rate hand me down But I walk it with a reverent air Cause everything is holy now Everything, everything Everything is holy now
families here. Breathing together, questing together, holding each other through it all, laughing and singing in the face of it. If there is a journey to liberation, if there is a way to live resurrection, I think it is like this. May what holds us in bondage to death or loss or hurt or sadness or literal heartbreaking limits be released. And what gives us life, hope, joy, rebirth, feel invited to claim us and may we claim it. Sinking our roots down into what grounds us, reaching toward the sun, flowering into this season, all of whose traditions witness to life more abundant, claiming us. After a season of loss and winter, struggles of heart and mind and spirit. And may we open our hearts to the abundance of creation that surrounds and sustains us. Amen. You're invited again to rise to join in singing. Please rise and body your spirit to sing together hymn number 163 for the earth forever turning found in the gray hymnal. Be seated. Closing words come from Norman V. Naylor. Reminded that we are part and participants of the universe, let us go forth from the quiet of this hour, encouraged to strive forward toward faithfulness, faithfulness to the best in ourselves, in others, and in the whole creation. Love and blessings to each of you. You are invited to close our time together by singing the well and after our closing hymn, please return to your seats for an announcement.
drink from the well together. Heart to heart we are dancing as one, dancing for justice, dancing for First, I just got to say it's so great seeing all of you here this morning for Celebration Sunday. Um, this announcement is particularly targeted to the members of our congregation who are eligible to vote in our congregational meeting on Sunday, June 9th, following the second service. Make a note of it in your calendar. And the bylaws task force of the Board of Trustees has been hard at work for many months to review and amend our bylaws. And this week, you will receive a single subject email regarding this activity, so please look for that and read it and give it your attention. The proposed amendments to the bylaws range from the mundane, such as changing board to board of trustees everywhere in the document, ranging to um, significant changes and how the Board of Trustees operates. We are proposing to change the size of the board from nine to seven trustees. Let me say that again. We're proposing to change the size of the board from nine to seven trustees. And we want to be in conversation with our membership about uh, all the proposed amendments. And to this end, we have scheduled four salons to discuss the topic. There will be two meetings over Zoom, one meeting after the first service on April 28th, that's next Sunday, and then uh, one meeting after the second service on May 5th. The first salon over Zoom is this Friday, April 26th, from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., and the URL for that will be in the email you received this week, and it will also be uh, sent in the e-news. So we hope that any issues regarding the proposed amendments to the bylaws will be worked out through these salons and that we will be ready to vote on them at our congregational meeting on June 9th. Any changes to the proposed amendments will take place at these salons or via email with the bylaws task force before they are finalized by the Board of Trustees on May 14th. So remember that we need a two thirds vote of the members in attendance at the congregational meeting to pass changes to the bylaws. So we hope you will take the time to attend one of the salons, and the first one is this Friday, and also attend our congregational meeting on June 9th. Thank you. Our social hour will begin in a few minutes online at the same Zoom link that you're on and in person in our courtyard. Those of you here in person may want to take your refreshments into the green room and have a visit with our online congregants. And Reverend Sharon and I look forward to greeting you at the chapel doors to hear your thoughts on the service. Have a lovely day. <laughs>